Hello, Wendy Reed. You Hi. are this week's teacher feature, and you've been, you're a violin teacher and a composer, and you've been teaching in the prep department for quite a while. Yes, since uh, 1980. And how did you um, get on board with prep music? Well, um, I moved from Los Angeles. My mother passed away, and after uh, kind of a bout with cancer, I moved back to the Bay Area because I had some connections with Mills College, having gotten a graduate degree there. And I uh, was looking for just any job when I arrived. In fact, I went through Montclair's village just trying to get a hot dog job or something. And no one would take me because I they figured I wouldn't stay very long with a master's in music. So then I strangely, I didn't even know about holy names at that point. So I went to the Raskob Institute for a job. And they said, well, we can't really use you, but why don't you go down to the music uh, prep department? It's just down the way here. So I just popped in. Myrna was there. Myrna Thomas, who uh, I don't know if everyone who's listening knows is uh, historical. Right. Yeah, a teacher, an amazing teacher, and um, also the director of the department. And we had to talk and she was very excited about me because she was looking for a violin teacher because Robin Ravelli was pregnant. So I ended up taking Robin's students for a while until she was ready to um, return. So the timing couldn't have been more perfect. And um, uh, Myrna almost hired me on the spot. She, you know, I had a background with, uh, I told her I studied with Nadia Boulanger in Paris. And she said that she, and then also Mills, and she called our David Rosenblum at Mills and uh, got a good recommendation. Thank goodness. <laughs> so that was it. And it was great. It was better than, you know, selling hot dogs at uh, Montclair Village. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Although nothing wrong with selling hot dogs, but yeah, you. I did many of those jobs. <laughs> yeah. I have as I have also. And you have a degree in composition from Mills? Yes, and also from um, USC. The, the performance you gave with your group and your bird Lulu at the Faculty and Friends concert, was that a premiere of your composition? That was, um, it was a premiere, a kind of a, a shorter version of a longer piece I did, uh, which was uh, an hour long piece originally. So I. I kind of trimmed it down to a just um, introduction to the piece for the faculty and friends concert, but it was uh, performed in 2019 at the uh, Franco Gawa Center. Hmm. Um, and uh, right, I heard I about that. That was in yeah. the paper. Yeah, and that one was also kind of uh, an offshoot of a piece I had at Other Minds concert. Uh, it was called Lulu Variations, and that was about my parrot and working with music and um, really the philosophy that uh, birds aren't just sound effects. Uh, they're actually musicians. In fact, they might be the greatest musicians on earth because their whole lifestyle is based on the sounds they make and how they interact. I, I heard, heard... <laughs> She's no, and I'm talking about her now. <laughs> I heard something about that on NPR a few months ago about birds and I wish I could remember what it was. If I can find it, I'll, I'll send you the link if you didn't hear it. But basically that they learn how to almost, even though they're, they may be all over the place with their various bird calls, they figure out, and they may not necessarily be communicating with each other, like one breed with another breed. They uh -huh. try to find um a harmonious way to be communicating within the din it's almost like they're hearing symphonically you know the way a composer would writing a symphony oh that's interesting I'll, yeah. I'll look for it and see if i can find it yeah um well, so the how... Go oh. ahead. well the interesting thing with lulu is i feel like she's half human and half bird because you know she's lived with me so she's not a wild bird 
but you know she definitely has uh, various traits that all birds have with communicating and uh, what's interesting though she does really improvise with me and also my violin lessons I think that a lot of kids enjoy her and she twists and turns little pieces around and makes it very entertaining she doesn't get too you know too involved because I want to focus on the lesson of course but uh, it makes it uh, also very interesting about just seeing a bird improvising like probably like like birds but also like humans mm -hmm. so it's not just for you know uh, details of your life survival you know techniques and communicating to um, have an, another uh, bird get enticed with you but it's actually playing around with the sounds and um, creating new sounds from the sound she hears which really exciting to me and I imagine you've heard that evolve oh yeah over time because she's been with you for a long time she plays games with me she'll say the my phone number I first thing I wanted to teach her was my phone number just in case she got lost and she does a little joke she says all the numbers except the last one wrong and <laughs> <laughs> she knows I'm going to say oh Lulu or something because she wants some reaction from me that's funny it really is I've heard they're very bright. Yeah, now she's a little, a little too bright sometimes. She took her cage apart one day. The bottom of the cage just fell down during a lesson. <laughs> so how did that happen? Wow. And then she gets out of her cage anytime she wants to. I would have to put a lock and key on her on her cage to keep her in. Uh huh. But so, you don't. You let her go in and out as she pleases. Yeah. She can do whatever she wants to. Uh, I used to have three cats, so that made me nervous. Yeah. She was on top of her cage when I came home, and I just didn't like that. So <laughs> she knew, she, I let her know that that was not good. And I think she was also a little fearful, too. She didn't want to get close to the cats. Yeah, I bet. But they all loved her. You know, it was, it was kind of interesting. I don't think they would have ever heard her, but I'm, I wasn't going to test it out. Mm -hmm. So. How do you balance composition with teaching? How much time do you spend? Is it like a routine every day or how do you do that? Well, um, it kind of uh, varies on a lot of, you know, for different reasons. Uh, my teaching is very important to me all the time. And sometimes uh, I will uh, be working on a piece if I have a performance coming up and then that becomes pretty heavy duty. But um, I would say, it's at least 50 50 or, or the teachings more. The composition is something that you do every day. I try to, you know, not necessarily um, writing down something, but I'm always thinking about the piece I'm working on. It's constant all the time. In fact, I'm always thinking about music and creating music all the time, uh, especially with uh, Lula's very inspiring in certain ways. I've been writing bird music since 1980. And um, it's, uh, she just continues to make me want to create little, um, just little, you know, like almost like haiku pieces or bird calls that she'll interact with. And she certainly mm -hmm. does all the time. So it's kind of having a partner all the time composing with you. Do you ever have to seek inspiration for composing something or does it always just come to you? No, well, you know, I will do little exercises all the time. So they're not necessarily totally inspired. Uh, I actually do a lot of harmonic exercises. For the first time I've been um, teaching, a, a, a student of mine said, can you teach me harmonics because I want to play your pieces. Mm. Uh, he, it was really surprising, but it was a, uh, a student who was always, is always interested in everything. So it surprised me that he would want to struggle with these harmonics just so he could get involved with what I'm doing. Because I usually kind of keep them separate. I feel like, you know, um, with teaching, people are coming to me to learn that instrument. And uh, I want to inspire them musically, but you almost have to be very disciplined and dedicated to your instrument, and then you can be free. As a child, did you want to become a composer? Um, well, what happened was, uh, I think the, when I first uh, I got the violin, I the G string was completely loose and I was 
tightening it and it was still loose and it was creating all these really interesting harmonics and I thought what an interesting sound that is uh, and so I was thinking why isn't that sound and it's all its variations a piece so it kind of came to me almost instantly wanting to explore sound um, when I was um, in high school I uh, went to Immaculate Heart High School and they had Immac Immaculate Heart College on the hill and when I was uh, a sophomore, I started taking classes in um, theory and composition up there. So it was a kind of a paradise where I could start early and get going because I did want to get more knowledge in that area. I think I've always wanted to create music or explore music. All the composers that really interested me were the more modern composers. Uh, when I first started writing, I, I wrote modal music uh, because I love Vaughn Williams. I love, in fact, I teach the Lark Ascending quite frequently. I think mm -hmm. it's a beautiful piece. Yeah. And then I started going into, you know, uh, Oliver Messian, uh, which is the bird composer. Most people know, most composers know, I should say. And then Luciano Berrio, um, Stockhausen, uh, composers who kind of like, instead of write melody and harmony, they write um, timbre, and texture mm. so um that's basically a kind of like what my music is it's musical processes which develop with a sound a single sound mm -hmm. and, and to and the and this melody is really a timbre which is quality of sound or exploration of a sound and it's not uh sometimes it's harmonics sometimes it can be various things like it won't be, if I do uh, use harmonics, I don't necessarily write a little melody, but it will be a sound that transfers into various stages. Mm -hmm. it's music, musical processes, and I always try to base them on nature in certain ways. So they're more like growing and not just finding the classical form they fit into. What instruments do you have available to you to do your to work on your compositions besides well, lulu <laughs> yeah no i have uh basically uh a lot of friends from experimental concerts uh available to me uh mills has this uh, contemporary um, performance ensemble every semester and sometimes i will take people from that or sometimes i will join the ensemble to be part of the uh the concert and have my piece performed. But um, there are um, probably any orchestral instrument. I know people who play them and I can use them for a piece. You it's hear it. It's an ensemble, so it's, it um, isn't necessarily defined instrumentation. You hear the music in your head and you write it down and then you bring the musicians into play it for you sometimes sometimes I, with musical processes sometimes I create a pattern and then I, I do variations on that pattern so sometimes the variations are kind of uh, complex so I'm not necessarily hearing them immediately in my head but I have an idea of what they're sounding like and then how they're going to interact when I have these instruments is another thing in my head but it's always nice to have the realization of the performance mm -hmm. What changes have you seen with families, family life, and students over the years, and how your teaching has had to change in a way to adapt to that? Well, um, I've seen a lot of changes in terms of people becoming more busy. It's difficult to get students to practice. Uh, they don't realize how much discipline is involved in um, developing skills on an instrument. And um, so when they have uh, the, the excuse is, well, I don't have time to practice because I have tennis, I have soccer, and there's just an array of, th of things that they have to do. It's a bit frustrating because they do have a good excuse. They're doing too many things. There is a certain dedication that is required and it's not easy to fit into most people's lives these days. It just seems to get more and more hectic. One thing I like about this COVID situation is I have people practicing who never practiced before very much. Right. And I love it. And uh, uh, a couple of them have fallen in love with the violin. 
And ideally, that's what is the most important thing to me if I can transfer my love of music to somebody else. It's, there's nothing more rewarding than that. What do you like to do to relax and decompress both pre-COVID and now that we're more limited in our opportunities? Uh-huh. Well, pre-COVID, I loved to swim. I almost swam every day. Mm. It was, it's my favorite exercise. Now, I don't own my own private pool, so it has become, you know, off uh, limits right now. Um, I do, I go for walks and I listen to music love to listen to um, new uh, compositions that people are creating all the time. And also just classical music too. A lot of the new music people aren't really into the classical. I'm totally in love with classical music as much as, you know, the more experimental music. What so, classical music do you love? Well, I love the um, uh, sonatas and partitas of Bach. I love teaching them. And I love listening to different uh, uh, performers. Uh, Bach is one of my favorite composers. It's been wonderful to have this talk with you and to have our families get to know you a little bit better. So thanks. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah.